Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion today, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Alexander S., Craig S., Reg M., Justin H., Paul M., and at DJC3798680. Returning to the program today is Mr. Duncan Crabe. Duncan is the Managing Director and CEO of Boss Energy Limited, the only restart development junior focused in Australia with its honeymoon ISR uranium project in South Australia. Boss Energy is listed on the Australian Securities Exchange under the symbol BOE and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol BQSSF. Duncan, it's been a while since we've had you on the podcast. Welcome back. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks for having me back on the show. It's great to be here. Absolutely, Duncan. It's been a while since we've done a formal podcast with you, so welcome back. And we do have some new audience, Duncan, uh, over here on our side. So I, otherwise, I wouldn't ask you to cover this again. But why don't we just kick this off here with your background and experience in the uranium sector? Sure. Uh, I entered the industry back in 2007 um, as the chief financial officer of a company called Kalahari Minerals. Uh, that company held a 43% stake in Extract Resources. Extract Resources um, discovered what was one of the largest uh, uranium deposits in that decade, being the Husab deposit in Namibia. And from initial exploration, we grew that deposit significantly. Um, to be such that uh, it attracted interest worldwide in acquisitions and as the uranium price continued to rise, interest continued to grow um, and eventually it led to a takeout in uh, April 2012 by China General Nuclear for $2.2 billion. Subsequent to that, uh, the chairman of China General Nuclear, Chairman Yu, offered me the opportunity of being the finance director in country to see that Husab mine go through its, its, um, its development, a $2.8 billion spend in addition to the acquisition cost. Uh, and we ended up commissioning that mine in October 2016. Upon commissioning the mine, I was offered an opportunity to return to Australia, having spent 16 years overseas and to work as this MD and CEO of Boss Energy. And uh, I took that opportunity and returned home for Christmas 2016. And a few weeks later, started working with uh, Boss Energy. And it's really just been a, a fantastic ride since then, really, as we've steadily progressed the asset, getting it to a point that it is today, about to enter, enter production in the, in the coming months. Good background. I think there's some pretty good pieces there and you've definitely been, the sector's been a core focus and 100% focus for you for well over a decade now. It's great to uh, to get that bit of experience as well as uh, attack on Namibia as part of your expertise as well. Just a bit more on the repeating end of things, if you will. Uh, just give us a concise view of the uranium sector conditions as they stand today you know, not so much on the broad commercial nuclear energy narrative, but specifics on the uranium market conditions you see that are compelling today. Oh, Andrew, where do I start? I mean, I think right now there's a couple of key aspects affecting the industry. I think security of supply concerns are, are dominating. Um, nuclear fuel markets are seeing that massive upheaval created by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and that invasion highlighted geopolitical uncertainty and the need for energy security as a priority by Western utilities in particular. So we're finding that those Western utilities are weaning themselves off that Russian influence supply, um, particularly as China and Russia are also taking up significant positions in Kazakhstan. And then compounding to this problem, you've got logistical deliveries from Kazakhstan are also vulnerable as they're unable to deliver through Russian ports. So what we're finding in uranium is supply is under threat, really, for the first time since the 1970s. And there's very little inventory. 
new production is needed in the near term. And that's where, you know, bringing Honeymoon on right now is our key focus because with this emphasis on security of supply, fuel buyers want uranium from producers in stable, friendly uranium countries such as Australia. And to our mind, um, given those factors, there's no doubt that there's going to be an overshoot uh, in the price of uranium in response to this currently forecasted supply deficit. There's absolutely no doubt that new production is needed. So when we look at that a bit further, you can see that demand is growing too. Um, mobile inventory levels are now significantly lower than they were in the early 2000s. Uh, inventories held by utilities are lower and they need to be replenished. So if we look at the US, they've got a, on average about two years of cover. The EU, less than 36 months of cover, drifting towards all time lows. And that's where we're saying that this tide has turned, that you know, utilities are very concerned that there's ins insufficient inventory to fill the gap. And, and then they look around the world, where's that new supply going to come from? So to answer your question succinctly, I, I just feel that this is the perfect timing to bring on new projects and prove and restart projects such as Honeymoon have that first mover advantage to come back online. And we're finding that um, we think the timing is now. We would rather be a little bit early than too late. And we're already getting, you know, enormous amount of inbound interest from fuel buyers to, to bring Honeymoon back into production and enter into offtake arrangements. Really, everything you said, I couldn't agree more with. A number of fronts, if you will, on inventory, just there's a lack of inventory for good people and a lack of inventory of good projects that don't have problems that uh, have a long lead time, whether it's permitting or in some cases, jurisdictional risk, countries that just won't, won't allow uranium mining, what have you. So really interesting set of conditions here. The longer this takes to finally get moving, the better it is overall for the industry. So uh, appreciate that. Why don't we jump into boss here. Uh, first of all, my congratulations to you, the team, and the shareholders for having boss be one of the least volatile, and also it is the least impacted junior equity in the sector going back to October 2021. Uh, really impressive. The nearest junior in terms of that parameter isn't even close, uh, so impressive once again, and just uh, talk briefly about that, and how do you keep it going from here, Duncan? Andrew, thank you. I mean, really, uh, we own our asset 100%. So what we undertook with the experience gained that I had in Namibia um, was really one of quickly assembling a, a strong team around me. It's all dependent on the people that you work with, I believe, particularly in this market where we've seen, due to the low commodity price over the last decade, a lot of those um, sort of professional within the industry moved on to work in other commodities whether it be nickel gold copper etc they moved away from uranium there simply wasn't the work the work just and the opportunities weren't there for them so when when i joined the company back in 2017 we immediately set about a strategy on how to bring honeymoon back into production how to assemble a solid team and how to de-risk that project so by de-risking, looking at increasing production throughput and lowering the operating costs, such that we can be competitive in today's market. And that's really the task that we set ourselves. And it's been, um, you know, it's been a challenge, no doubt. It's been seven years of hard work and it's really only these last few years that we're seeing, you know, predominantly this mis mismatch between supply and demand. And that's where restarts and existing production can meet that demand in the time frame. So, we also find that the number of producers in politically safe countries that can meet the demand is limited. And there again, Boss Energy with its mine in Australia really has that first mover advantage. So the mine's located in a state called South Australia. South Australia is the premier uranium district within Australia. The reason being the only two producing mines for uranium are in South Australia, the other two being BHP's Olympic Dam and General Atomic Heathgate operation. So we're, we're due to be the third state uranium mine, and for that matter, one of the first in the past decade uh, within Australia. So we're on time now, we're on budget to achieve first uranium production by December this year. The project itself, it's fully permitted, low cost, it's a restart asset, previously produced and exported uranium, 
the call being placed in care and maintenance back in 2014 due to low uranium prices. So since we acquired the project, we've really been executing a strategy to maximise value by preparing for this turn in the commodity cycle, which is now taking place. But what, what really sets us apart, I believe, from other um, projects is that we took advantage of the equity markets uh, last year. We raised $125 million in March 2022. We're fully funded. Uh, we've got about $87 million worth of cash in Australian terms uh, to finish the CapEx build. Absolutely no debt, so zero debt. Plus, we have £1.25 million pounds of strategic inventory uh, held at the Confidine facility in Illinois um, that we purchased the previous year, in March 2021. So having that strong balance sheet really does set the project apart. We're also, as mentioned, Honeymoon's 100% owned. And more importantly, it's fully permanent. So by that, all our native title and environmental agreements are in place. And we've got a federal government endorsed export permit for up to 3.3 million pounds. So what we're doing is with our restart construction preparations is increasing the production throughput to 2.45 million pounds per annum. But we've got the ability now to go up to the 3.3 million pound export permit that we want to do um, by proving up some of our significant exploration and mine life extension possibilities. In the meantime, with our studies, what we've managed to do is decrease the operating costs to become a low cost producer. Uh, cash costs sub 20 US per pound. Your all in costs at around 32 US per pound. So that, that is very competitive. Um, and really, you know, when you, when you sit back and think about it, uranium supply really is a matter of price and timing. And that's really uncertain these days. Many projects require high prices to incentivize production. We're finding interest rates going up around the world. Exchange rates are, are jumping around and highly volatile. In the industry, it's touted that US $80, per, $80 per pounds needed to, to sort of incentivize that new production. And we're clearly ahead of that curve. So the platform set for us, and, and we're well positioned now to, to build a strong sort of multi-asset platform going forward. But as mentioned, it's a strategy we embarked upon sort of seven years ago, and we've steadily been chipping away at that. And, and um, I'm pleased to, pleased to report that we're, we're still on track, we're on budget, we're on time for that fourth quarter production this year. Duncan, that's great. I appreciate that. And, and man, it's hard to believe that it's been seven years, to be honest with you. Seems like a few years ago, you and I were at a conference together, and it's just unbelievable that seven years going here. You know, you mentioned timing. You're absolutely right that timing is such an important element of the sector. As a friend of mine who will go unnamed in the sector, you know, at $50 a pound term contracts, even a monkey could get a contract at that price. Those folks that have been able to to hold out and understand who've done the work, understand where the pricing is headed and where you can take advantage of that, uh, I think is just an extra edge, meaning you've done the extra work and you're have prepared and thought out a strategy to get better pricing than just $50 a pound in a term contract. I mean, when we looked at the pricing aspect, we have from our feasibility studies an all-in cost at around 32 US per pound. But that doesn't mean that we wait for the market to show us, yes, you can enter into contracts at 32 US per pound. What, what I believe one needs to do is then factor in, say, a 30% margin to take into account whether it be foreign foreign exchange fluctuation or rising interest rates, inflation rates, you need a buffer. So when we looked at our project, we thought, well, it's not time to restart until we can start seeing visibility in offtake contracts at least 45 to 50 US per pound. So that's what we've been waiting for. For a company to bring a mine on, you really do need that buffer. So yeah, it's, it's a matter of patience and as you say, timing and Really, now what we want to do is is utilise that first mover advantage, really get there in production, similar to what I experienced back in 2007 uh, working in the industry, that when the price moves, it can move really quickly. And we, we got a taste of that when the Sprott Commodity Trust first entered the market. But, um, you know, back in 07, 06, 07, 08, the, pound, the price was moving dollars a pound per week. I mean, it's terribly exciting. So... 
uh, let's see where this market goes, but we're already seeing a, quite a firming of, of actual price. Um, even without the financial players such as Sprott being in the market, um, utilities are supporting this um, this term price, which is just terrific to see. And um, yeah, I just think that there's likely to be further pressure on the spot and term prices. Financial entities enter the market and owners of new, newly reprieved nuclear power plants re-enter the market. So very exciting period. Yeah, no, certainly first mover in the sense of ISR restart operations and, and the potential there, but not a first mover in the sense of first contracts, first term contracts, Duncan. So well done on the sense of holding out for no term contracts. So, and we've got a, a fantastic price point at, at this stage in the market to be able to negotiate uh, good term contracts that work out well for both parties um, and really reward the folks that have been able to do uh, the right things in this sector, you know, as you said, over the last seven years or so since we got started. I, I know you touched on this earlier on a few things, but can you just give us a quick update on the capital structure, Duncan, in terms of cash and equivalents, such as inventory on hand, shares outstanding, and also, if you don't mind highlighting the major shareholders? So we're fully funded. We've got in Australian dollar terms, and I'll just keep it in that currency, uh, about $87 million in cash. The 1.25 million to strategic inventory is valued today at around $112 million as well. So you're really looking at almost a $200 million liquid assets, uh, again, with zero debt. That's where we're at at the moment. There's still, I'd say, to, to finish the CapEx build that we've got, we'll probably be spending at least 75 of that to finish the actual project itself. But what a beginning to launch a new mine into a rising market with a very strong balance sheet. The purpose of the strategic inventory that we purchased was not simply that we believed that the uranium price was going to rise back in March 21 when we acquired it for around 30, 30 US, uh, what was it, 30.15 US per pound. I mean, today it's at around 58 US per pound, but that wasn't the primary focus. The primary focus was to give us the best opportunity to be at the point that we are now, that we can negotiate with utilities and say, um, and not get sort of um, uh, sort of tightened down on, on terms, but to actually say, look, if there is any issues, uh, which we don't believe there will be any, but if there are in the ramp up period of honeymoon, uh, then we've got an ability to supply into that contract um, from our strategic holding. So that in itself gives the utility a lot of reassurance that we'll meet our contractual obligations. Secondly, all mines need working capital to get going. Um, you know, there, there's often, it's fine, you've raised the money, you've, you've provided for your capex build, but then what? Then you start production, you've got those operating costs coming in while it takes a short period of time to start earning uh, revenue. And that's, again, where we're covered because we've got that working capital support. So so from a balance sheet capital perspective, uh, it, it's very strong. In terms of our largest shareholders, they're predominantly some of the main ETFs worldwide that we see, um, which are fairly standard throughout the industry. And then we have, in terms of Australia, certainly um, some of the largest institutions, funds actually um, supporting Honeymoon and the project, and they've been there um, going through the various capital raises that we've done over the over the seven years. And I'm pleased to report pretty much every, in fact, every capital raise we've had, we've grown upon that. So that in itself has been just terrific. Um, in terms of when we look at sort of the capital performance, in terms of market capitalization, we're around $1.2 billion Australian. The share price this morning hit around $3.40 Australian dollars per share. In terms of ordinary shares on issue, we have around 353 million shares. And then we also have in addition about 1.8 million options with various exercise prices that we have amongst our, our workforce to encourage them, incentivize them and retain them as we go into the future. So really, um, We've got a lot of flexibility, very strong company, and that was uh, always our goal to sort of give this honeymoon the best birth it can have into, a, into this new market.
Very well. I appreciate that. Uh, pretty good setup, and, and certainly you're getting quite a bit of respect out there in the market, as you know, Duncan, just in terms of market capitalization and everything that's been set up here. So well done on that front. And then also just your, your comment you. about incentivization of staff. You know, I think that that gets overlooked often, and people often scratch their head and say, oh, why, why do these people have options and this and that and the other? Fact of the matter is you have to, you must incentivize and you also have to attract talent and that's so important as well. If I may, Andrew, I mean, it's, it's really important for the audience to, to understand that aspect. I mean, projects are dependent on the people, there's no doubt. And as you're finding new, you know, new minds are coming onto the various stock exchanges, et cetera, they're out there competing for that working capital. They're out there competing for those personnel. So it's really um, important, and I think what sets projects apart at this stage of the cycle, there are many new uranium companies being listed, but you'll find if you look deeply, how many of those actually have the, the experience? How many of those have worked in an operating uranium mines before? How many have actually sold uranium to utilities? That That is so very important and often overlooked. So. You know, we we deliberately um, took a lot of time here and we've assembled a board of directors that's very strong and capable. White Buck being the chair, um, he was with Cameco from 1991 to 2006. He was general manager of their Key Lake projects. Sorry, their, their, um, their primary projects being uh, MacArthur River and Key Lake. Um, he was then recruited, headhunted by Paladin. He was the executive GM of operations for Paladin. He oversaw the commissioning to nameplate of their flagship mine, Langer Heinrich, built the Kalakira project. So this will be his fourth uranium mine he's actually commissioned. It'll be my second, in addition to Husab. Um, so, um, you know, there's vast experience there. Then you've got Brim Jones, who spent, you know, he spent a good 20 years in the industry. Um, even more, he was at, at Heathgate Resources, very our nearest mine with in situ recovery and iron exchange, chemical engineer by background. Jan Honeyman, very experienced in HR matters, came across from First Quantum where she had over 14,000 um, employee workforce. And, and those skills are so critical with that retention and attracting people. And then in management, well, we've got some of the world's top uranium uh, personnel. Sashi Davies is on sales. She's one of the top world's top uranium traders to leading uranium hydrologists and plant operators. And we're also self-performing our construction activities. So rather than an EPCM environment where you contract a third party and engineering uh, firm, self-perform means we ourselves have recruited our own engineers, designers, etc., meaning that we control our own destiny. We direct the engineering, the procurement, the contracting, and we do this by employing our own people who are closely aligned with company objectives. They're gaining knowledge and familiarity during this construction phase such that it can roll over into operations. We know our people, we've worked with them for many years, and I, I would argue that it saves from a capex spend perspective, about 20 to 30 percent of the premium that they're charged. So so that's where these incentives come in and, you know, it just builds close alignment and it's already proved successful. So, yeah, no, we're, we're thrilled to, to have been able to adopt that approach. But I've, I've yeah. got it in. Sorry, Andrew. It's just something I feel very passionately about. And I think when you look at projects, it's fine. You can look at resource, you can look at country, jurisdiction, etc. But look at the people, look at the experience. Have they been there before? Can they do it again? That's the key. Yes, absolutely agreed. And certainly that's the way to approach this. And of course, there always be one, maybe one superstar that pops up at some point that might be a newbie. But for the most part, uh, it's all based on experience, Duncan. So I appreciate those comments. And then also just the, the coverage of people as well and demonstrating uh, you guys have quite a bit of depth there at BOSS as well. Why don't we move over to an operational update on activities at Honeymoon? And then also with that operational update, just lay out the project schedule over, say, the next eight months or so and where you think you'll be. Sure. Honeymoon is really, as mentioned, in situ recovery form of mining. Um, and we're adopting now the iron exchange circuit at the front end of our plant. So iron exchange is really the breakthrough for our restart. It's the centerpiece of our processing plant that's going to drive those efficiencies and increase the production throughput. And as a result, lower the operating costs. So 
most of our studies over the past six, seven years have been focused on iron exchange, testing resins, making sure that we've got the right uh, method going forward. Um, it's, it's important to note that iron exchange is used in the vast majority of uranium in situ leach operations in Kazakhstan and in the US, for example, Wyoming, Texas. In terms of operating in capital costs, it has significant advantages over other technologies. And it's for those reasons that the iron exchange uranium mines have really been the key ones that have survived and prospered during the past decade of low uranium prices, as we've seen with Kazakhstan. So in recent years, those profitability margins have been increasing and now they're really set to grow. So we focused on iron exchange, but really combined with iron exchange, we're looking at increasing or doubling the size of our water treatment plant. We're adopting new well field strategies um, such that we can use more modern techniques of applying our filters and pumping rates, et cetera, but also the lixivient that's used. So the chemistry set that's used to actually leach the uranium. And in addition, we're introducing two new high temperature calciners in the drying circuit such that we can heat the product up to produce U308 rather than UO4, which was previously produced. And that's the way the world's heading, U308 production. So in terms of where we are right now, all our major long lead items or tenders have been issued. Um, orders for critical equipment have all been placed. We've, we've got over 170 procurement packages have been awarded. Some 80% of the CapEx forecast has been now ordered and within um, budget. We've taken receipt of, of most of the material now, which is terrific on site. So when we set out, we thought, given that the world's faced with this higher inflationary costs, employees and staff are expensive to use and contractors. So our goal was let's get the equipment to site first and then really pick up in earnest the construction activities, which is where we are now. And in fact, the next two months will reach peak personnel numbers on site during the construction stage. Our startup well field installations complete, flushing will start soon, our gypsum ponds complete, our water treatment plants nearing completion. First iron exchange column was delivered two weeks ago, which was very exciting because it sort of crystallizes the last um, all that all those technical studies, but pleased to see that they're there. Um, major transformers, the electrical transformers have been have arrived on site. We've opened an office in Adelaide and our workforce continues to grow. We should have, a, I think yesterday we had, being Sunday, 105 people on site. So a lot of activity taking place. Over the next four to six months, really, Wellfield flushing is the key. That gets underway soon. And that's the first part of the project. So for the next few months, flushing the Wellfield, getting it primed, getting it ready to be turned on. Um, meanwhile, the construction activities on the water treatment plant the new two cow signers and the iron exchange columns will be erected to get that first production in December this year. By late January, early February, we'll have our first drums of uranium produced, ready to be shipped. So that gives an indication of those, you know, we're in this critical phase now of, of final construction activities. In addition to that, uh, we will be looking to ramp up production during 2024 next year up to around 850,000 pounds to 1 million pounds, the second year up to 1.6 million pounds, and then on to the 2.4 million pounds. So it's a steady ramp up um, as, as we go through the plant in its turning it back on. So very exciting period. And I guess, you know, overshadowing that, of course, is we're getting closer to production. So now's the time to start looking at, at contracting. And I want to get to that contracting bit in a moment, get some of your thoughts on how you uh, see the contracting book filling out here. But let's uh, come back to operations here and let's just assume, you know, over this time period that, you know, everything goes well on the long lead items, installation work goes well and other work leading up to the commissioning. Uh, talk about what risk you see related to production, including any potential processing methodology risks that impacted the operations last cycle, and then any strategies to deal with the potential issues if they occur. So previous operations, what they were using a method called solvent extraction as opposed to iron exchange. So the reasoning for that is that they, the previous operators hadn't identified a resin that could cope in that, that sort of hard gypsum uh, type environment. So 
we did extensive studies with the Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organisation, and we did a lot of desktop sort of lab net testing. And then we rolled that out. We're having such success with the number of resins that we rolled that out to do a field leach trial uh, for six months back in 2017, testing the new resins. And, you know, we're just absolutely delighted with the progress. I mean, irrespective of the grade of uranium, because you test different grades in this scenario, we had a, a, um, a pilot plant operating with 18 different sort of columns of varying grades of uranium held within. And overall, we achieved a 95% recovery using that iron exchange methodology and the resins we had found. So that, that was the game breaker. So I believe that was the biggest, that allows you to increase production throughput and lower your operating costs, which is one of the biggest changes from the previous operations. One of the risks attached to that, of course, is which resin are you using? Uh, are there available resins or alternatives if one supplier is unable to deliver? And we've found four now resin suppliers in different parts of the world to supply us in that regard. So we believe we've mitigated that concern. Um, so I think from a iron exchange perspective, we're, we're looking good. Um, in terms of the well field, uh, one of the problems they had previously was the leaching of uranium from the well field. They weren't, I believe, optimizing the grades that could be leached and again we've tried um, in that field leach trial and subsequently different sort of leaching chemistry sets or that lixivient that we put through the well field um, we found that by lowering the ph increasing or adding ferric as an oxidant we've been able to increase the leach the, the sort of ability to get higher tenors of uranium being leached from those well fields and and that combined with iron exchange makes this project now really profitable and able to be a low cost producer. So I think to me, they were the key risks really um, that we had to overcome and it's, it's been well documented and, and we've certainly addressed those key concerns over the years. Going forward now, what are our key risks? I think fortuitously, you know, we will be earning US dollar based revenue on our sales, which I think is important. We're finding that the Australian dollar, particularly in recent times, is beginning to, to fall somewhat. Um, so this provides us some insulation there. Um, you know, you really want to be earning US revenue at a period like this. Um, so I think that's one of the key risks that foreign exchange. I think in terms of commodity price as a risk, uh, we feel that that's mitigated. And we really do believe that I mean, particularly that um, we are, that there's going to be a pinch point within the next three years, and that's going to give likely give rise to an overreaction in commodity price because there's simply not enough supply or inventory to meet demand. So that's where a company like Honeymoon, a proven restart uranium mine, can really shine. I mean, we've been preparing and working hard for this moment, um, and that that's exactly why we're positioned this way. So, yeah, I think that really covers, you know, broadly, Andrew, what our key risks are, what our concerns are. We've had plenty of time to prepare for this this point. It's all got to come together, of course, but to date, I mean, the well fields are ready to be flushed and we're going into a really healthy part of our ore body uh, that sits just adjacent to the mine. So I'm very confident in that regard. Appreciate that. And the market uh, appears to, you know, definitely share the, the work that's been done and, and the confidence is, is certainly reflected there in the, in the price of the equity as well. I think that covers it off pretty well and excited to see uh, the commissioning phase start up here. And, and uh, boy, what a uh, interesting and enjoyable time to see uh, cake in a can. That would be great. How about sales strategy? Because this is something else that's an interesting one, and, and it's always good to get people's opinions on this, Duncan. And of course, you guys have uh, developed this and talked about this internally for a, quite a while, and I'm sure you have a, a pretty good strategy here, and including what you guys have done so far, which is, I think has been a smart move looking back and just understanding the market dynamics. But talk a little bit about how you guys plan to sell material in terms of a contracting mix for a portion of production, if there's any spot exposure, how far out you expect to book those sales, maybe if there's any prepayments, uh, and if you can, maybe some pricing parameters that you're looking for, because you know next year you, you're ramping up, you might have 850 to a million, as you said, and then onward from there over the next, uh, you know, call it 24 months. Just talk about that. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, we, it's a really fascinating one. And, you know, at what time do you bring a mine back into production? How do you see the market? Where does it rise? And that in itself, yeah, look, I'll be honest, I had a few sleepless nights, quite a few initially. Do we go now? Do we wait? How are we seeing the market? How good's the intel that we're receiving? I mean, a lot of due thought and consideration was given there. What we did notice, particularly in recent times, the last 12, 18 months, is that the market pricing is responding, particularly in the term market. And we're seeing a lot more activity um, and we're a lot of more inbound interest from utilities. We've had several site visits now from utilities or representatives of utilities wanting to sort of kick the tires on honeymoon and, and see that it exists and how well it can operate, et cetera. So if the market just started picking up um, and we found that prices have really moved from what we call inventory driven to production driven. And that's based on year cost estimates. And, you know, we believe that given the rising inflation and interest rates, that the marginal cost of future mines will be a lot higher than forecast even two years ago. So we wanted to be in a position that we could sell into a rising market as an existing producer with uncommitted supply from exploration, current mine, and potentially acquisitions. So what what that sort of reflecting on that another way is that when we look to finance honeymoon's restart, um, the problem with debt is that you have to underpin it with your contracts. So a debt provider will say, sure, we can lend you the funds, but where's our guarantee? And by that, what they look for in a uranium mine prior to production is by entering into a series of offtake arrangements to give them some sense of, of guarantee or, or assuredness that they're going to be repaid. What we found when we were ready to make the decision, the final investment decision, um, just over a year ago, the uranium prices weren't yet high enough. And in a way, if we commit the first four years of production to paying off debt, then we would have undersold our project. You're almost giving away that blue sky. And thank goodness we held out because uranium prices have risen since then. And in fact, the market signals we are seeing very much dovetails with that positive, optimistic sentiment expressed by Cameco in their recent quarterly announcements. We're confident we will announce contracts prior to entering into production. We've been resisting that temptation to do so, to lock in those higher prices. And as I said, you know, we're, we're thank goodness we have adopted that strategy because it's proved to be correct. Our well-defined strategy is to now enter into market-related contracts with varying tenures, so call it three years, five years, seven years, to keep growing with the market and seizing those higher prices. Um, and as mentioned, we really do believe that in these next three years, there's going to be a, a real pinch point. I mean, if you look at last year in 2022, 124 million pounds of uranium was contracted. I think the prior year in 2021, there was less, there was about 72 million pounds contracted. So gradually the amount of pounds being contracted is increasing. Already year to date, about 120 million pounds have been contracted. So already we're at the same level as where we were last year. So to our minds, it follows that the best deal that a new producer or any producer can make in a rising market is to secure market-related contracts with a strong floor and high ceiling. And that's exactly what our strategy has been. So what we're seeing now, similar to what Cameco expressed recently, was you know ceil uh, floors around uh, in the high 40s to 50, ceilings at around 80 US per pound. And, and to us, we believe that, that, that those floor and ceilings are linked to a, an indice or an index, but we do believe that they're um, the likelihood is that they're going to keep increasing and that's what we want to effectively layer into. So in terms of how much do we want to enter into, probably about 20 to 30% prior to getting into production. Um, we do feel that even though there's talk of us selling to the spot market, you can buy market related contracts does give you that exposure to the spot market. The benefit of a term contract is that it guarantees uh, homes for the pounds that you're producing. And it's important to bear in mind that while the spot market is active, it's predominantly active amongst traders, not necessarily utilities. Utilities, far and wide, their preference is to enter into actual 
term contracts. So that's the method that we would be adopting. Um, but really just to take our time, just to grow into the market. And that's part of also why we're having our sort of, you know, relatively controlled ramp up period because we want to get rolling. We want to get the mine up and running. We want the people involved in getting to know their, their plant, but also grow with the market as it begins to move forward. So much is wrapped into these term contracts and the optionality they provide and then the sustainability they provide. It's very difficult to rely 100% on the spot market. That's a lot of risk that you're carrying there. So term contracts, big deal here. And to slot them in after you finance the project really makes a lot of sense here, Duncan. So I'm excited to see some of the initial ones that come out. And, you know, obviously you guys are holding back some ammunition, uh, as you know, here as well, um, as you guys start to ramp up. Just moving on here, um, I think we got a good reasonable flavor for the sales strategy here. But, you know, one of the other things I wanted to touch on here was the exploration work and the testing to bring on potential satellite deposits in the future to even get potentially more production out of Honeymoon. Jason's and also Gold's Dam, which appear to be really in the immediate pipeline for the company after restart and, of course, production milestones are achieved. Uh, just talk about that. What's the plan here in order to, you know, essentially bring on additional pounds as you guys start to deplete, but then also uh, bring some more upside as well? Thank you. So basically, our current honeymoon mine startup and feasibility studies were based on resources held within a pre-existing mining license. And that mining license holds the processing plant and about 36 million pounds of resource in measured indicated inferred categories so that's what we modeled and and have, have basically restarted the mine on outside of that mining license sits the two satellite deposits that you've referred to jason's and gould's dam collectively um, and coincidentally they also add up to 36 million pounds so what we want to do now is is prove up those satellite deposits. They're largely in the inferred indicated jork categories, so measured categories. So we want to prove them up to a more measured, uh, higher confidence level. That work is currently being undertaken. So we've already started drilling on Gould's Dam. Only last week, actually, I we put out a, an announcement for the first 20 holes of 60 holes but showing some fantastic intercepts there, um, really confirming the historical drill results. We're getting up to, for example, five metres at 3,500 ppm and, um, you know, a couple of other big, really big intercepts, all at a good shallow grade, a shallow depth at around 100, 120 metres, uh, which is ideal for our in-situ recovery. Our goal is to really increase the, as mentioned, the mine life or the production throughput. So our, our sort of two-pronged strategy for creating shareholder value with the resource has always been, let's start production and cash flow from honeymoon, and then you grow your uranium in inventory that can increase that mine life and production rate. So when we, since acquiring the project uh, back in December 2015, we've in fact grown the resource from about 16 Point seven million pounds to seventy two million pounds, so quite a big you know over four hundred percent increase in res in resources and hopefully we can set to to increase that even further um, it's not just at the moment we're concentrating on those satellite deposits, but there's also uh, greenfield exploration targets too that we want to capitalize on we're no different to any other mining project or the industry over the past ten years. With the commodity in the doldrums, they simply it was very difficult to raise money just to explore when uranium prices were low. Now that we'll have a cash flow positive producing mine, that overflow of funds can be directed towards drilling and exploring and, and also seeking new acquisitions. And that, that's really what we've been trying to achieve and what we're setting out to do. So yeah, exciting times there. And I think the initial drill results certainly that have been announced to the market show the potential that we can really grow the uh, production rate in mine life, which is which is very exciting. Yeah, that's great, Duncan. And it's all vicinity that, that can work pretty well with Honeymoon. Mm. And, and as well, like, like you said, I, to be able to convert what you have there in higher confidence categories, I think that's in part a foregone conclusion in the sense that, uh, you know, you guys should be able to to turn over some of that 
those pounds there that, that are already there and then also uh, find additional pounds as well here so excited to see yep. the uh, the work start to commence and as you guys start to cash flow and there becomes expiration capital available uh, from operations some of the efforts on that front sure, sure. how about efforts on community Duncan uh, talk a little bit about that I always like to ask our guests about you know what they're doing on community and of course small junior equities but uh, at different stages and of course you guys are growing and becoming a producer at some point here soon and so you know just talk a little bit about what the company is doing here to bring up you know new talent work skills local area enhancement local service providers and other efforts on the community front no thanks very much it's a good question um, also one that very much is close to our hearts and, and doing it properly. Honeymoon is in a, a remote location in the outback of South Australia. Uh, the nearest regional town is about 70 kilometres to our southeast as the crow flies being Broken Hill. In fact, Broken Hill is what BHP took its name from um, way back over 100 years ago when it was a large silver producing area. Um, but really, there is a contingent of workforce there. But it, that's slightly just across the border in New South Wales. Um, our other primary efforts are really like, you know, dedicated towards South Australia and building the expertise of uranium within South Australia. As mentioned, Honeymoon will be the third operating uranium mine in that state, and it's the only state that has producing uranium mines in Australia. So there is a workforce of talent. Um, there's the ability to attract people with the right qualifications and experience. Um, but we really do want to nurture that and bring new graduates through the system as such that they can be part of the long term journey of the company. So in terms of community employment and what we look to do there, certainly we're looking around our surrounds, Broken Hill, South Australia, attracting the right workforce. In terms of more of our immediate neighbours being the pastoralists who operate in the area, we have several initiatives operating there, predominantly with looking after the leaseholding, the road work, et cetera, some of the water bores, um, just working with local community on what, what assistance we can provide them and whether there is other opportunities. And then we look further at the actual traditional owners of the land, of which we have several groups that we work with, predominantly the Willakali group, the Agnamantha and the Nudri Nation. Um, they're our historical owners of the land uh, to whom we, we always pay our respects to, um, many of whom have got, or of all three groups, there's a representative now working on the mines. And certainly when we do our cultural clearances, heritage clearances prior to drilling, they play an active role and actually approve all sort of exploration works before we undertake them. So it's, it's a mandatory part of doing operating in Australia. And in fact, they'll also enjoy the benefits of set royalties from when we are in production. So they've almost got a vested interest as well to see Honeymoon come into production. You know, it was only a few weeks ago that I was having dinner on site in the mess hall and a chap called Mick Coulthard of the Agnamantha people uh, joined me for dinner and he said, you know, Duncan, I know we're focused on construction at the moment, but what do you think if I became cultural captain, building awareness of Aboriginal heritage on site and teaching our ways and customs to the employees? And I just said, Mick, that's just such a great idea. And why don't you consider doing it with Alfie, who's from the Willakali people, who's currently out there assisting the geologists drilling on the Goulds Dam deposit. So almost like two cultural captains representing the two biggest groups on our tenements and I think that's just fabulous and you know to have that initiative um, and be so positive about it in fact Mick wants to start teaching his language he's that passionate about it so it means a great deal to us and you know I'm very proud to say 10% of our workforce of Aboriginal heritage and you know 15% of our workforce are female as well which is also important attracting women into the industry so I'm very much committed to building upon this and, and be a real um, employer of choice as we as we go into production and, and set to grow our operations. So, yeah, it, it's, it's incredibly important to have that strong stakeholder relationship. Uh, and then it flows through to actually the, um, the sort of support we're getting from state government with those initiatives. And 
our state government is very, very strongly supportive of Honeymoon coming into production. These things are very important and just some of the personal experiences you shared there while you're at site and some of the uh, initiatives of some of the employees as well as just the the economic generation in that rural part of South Australia. All very, very important um, because it's very difficult to generate economies without things like mining. And so good comments on that and I appreciate you sharing that with us. I want to switch over here to jurisdictional risk and would like to get your view on it now that, of course, the uranium community has been reminded yet again uh, on this element to investing, which is jurisdictional risk. Uh, talk about your thoughts, if you have any, on the Niger government debacle, as well as jurisdictions that you like, Duncan, uh, for uranium. Uh, and of course, let's exclude South Australia here because we know that's a good one. I, I better be cautious with my words on other jurisdictions because I'm I'm not as familiar as I, I once was, say, for example, with Namibia. Um, I'd lived in Namibia with my wife and two children for four years as we got the Husad mine into construction, commissioning, production, and had spent five years prior to that flying in and out of Namibia, getting that project to its stage. So very familiar with government, very familiar with infrastructural requirements, etc. But that, to me, is a friendly uranium-producing country. I, but I wouldn't be too familiar with the current state of politics, having not worked there for some time. But what it shows when we look across to Niger is, let's face it, I mean, the world is a challenging place at the moment, and third world countries do suffer economic hardship, um, being third world. And, you know, it can give cause to civil unrest at times. And with that, foreign owned or projects can sometimes be at risk. And the risk is, you know, eventually I'm sure the mines will come on and come into production. But, but it does give you the additional risk of, of saying from an investment perspective, there may be delays in time frames to actually get those projects up and running um at the same time that the management and executive want them to to operate and to me that from an investment thesis sometimes poses a risk i've got no doubt that they're very qualified people behind the companies doing their best efforts to get them up and running but sometimes those economic factors and the the populations within third world countries can play a play a component you know you know it's something uh to be very mindful of investing um when you look at your projects uh, from an investment perspective, what jurisdictions are they located in? You know, are they friendly to uranium? Do they actually have the infrastructure? Do, can they supply water? Can they supply electricity? Can they supply skilled, experienced personnel who are not at risk of danger performing their employment duties? So those type of concerns, I think, are, are ones that are very important to consider. I think that Projects need to also consider what are the hurdles for getting mine permits or any permitting approved and are the local government and local communities supportive. So, you know, you can see in countries and applications for mine licenses get submitted and a year later they still haven't um, been approved. What, what are the hurdles that the companies have to jump through? And that to me is also really important to assess on any project, you know, these qualitative factors. And as mentioned before, you know, do these projects have access to experienced personnel in those countries? And, and to me, that, that's really, you know, they're the real important value add questions to consider with a, with a project. And certainly one that we take very seriously when we, for example, assess other projects for in terms of acquisition status. So absolutely, we want to pursue M&A and, and we really want to grow our platform. We've been focused on getting Honeymoon restarted and dealing with the issues of the past and getting it to where it is today. And, you know, hopefully it, it makes great profits going into a, a rising market. But if I was asked which countries would I look at in terms of future growth, Preferably at the moment with the concerns, the geopolitical concerns worldwide, our focus is currently on Australia, North America, Canada, Europe, for example. They're, they're our primary areas, but by all means, if uh, you know, worked and lived and in fact born in Africa, so a lot of experience there. If a project shuts out and looks viable, we can certainly consider it. But 
for the time being, we're really focused on those sort of more westerns and countries at the moment. Well said, Duncan. Lots to unpack there with the jurisdictional question. And, you know, obviously another supply question is, can you supply stability? You know, that's that's another one that I think is important. And you touched on it too, permits. You look at some of the things like, for example, honeymoon. I mean, what would it take to permit honeymoon from a green field and bring it into production? What's the time frame? Now, South Australia, it's, it's quite a bit better than other jurisdictions in Australia. But nonetheless, you have to ask that question. And so jurisdictional risk doesn't just come with, you know, the so-called AK-47 in the air with a red flag, mm -hmm. maybe, but also how much red tape, and, and I'll pick on Canada, I'll pick on the U.S., you know, you know, Canada and the U.S. to permit something from greenfields is substantial. To restart something is still substantial. You know, you look at Canada from the sense of, depending on what province, you have to deal with uh, permitting processes that could take 10 years. And so I think that risk you have to weigh, obviously, in a lot of different parameters. And so it's not just necessarily about, uh, you know, maybe an African jurisdiction where you have a quick permit, you know, lead time, fairly straightforward process where places like the U.S. and Canada are becoming quite bureaucratic. And in some senses, uh, you have to scratch your head. Why does it take so long? And the answer is there's really no good answer other than just bureaucracy plays its course. But, uh, you know, very good points, and I appreciate your comments. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, I mean, you're looking at from greenfield to brownfield. I mean, you're looking at sort of a eight to ten year time horizon. And, I mean, it is such a geopolitically sensitive commodity to mine. In Australia, it's one of the most heavily regulated form of mining uh, in Australia, if not the most heavily regulated. So it's incredibly um you know, strict and, and a lot of hurdles to go through. There's no doubt government works with you to bring these projects on, but they they go to an extra level that one needs to, to deal with. And, and that also costs time as well as the uh, cost time and it costs money to, to satisfy. But yeah, being fully permitted is a, a big thing. And to, um, when I mentioned before the export permit that we have, well, there are only four operations in Australia with an export permit. and by having an export permit indicates that all your other permitting is in good working order. And that's a key, key aspect. So yeah, never ever underestimate the permitting side. Yeah, great points, Duncan. I appreciate that. Well, thanks for your time, Duncan. I'd like to leave it there for now, but I just want to also ask here to wrap up, of course, any other comments you have before we go, but uh, for potential investors who are listening in, the company has a market capitalization of about 1.2 billion Australian dollars. Why should Boss Energy be considered within the institutional family office and retail investors portfolio? Uh, Andrew, thank you. And thanks very much for having me on, on your show. I mean, uh, it's great to be back. Why invest in BOSS? Because we believe that not only will we be in production in the coming months, but we're really coming into production at the right time. We're coming in at a time that uh, it's the beginning of the new cycle. There's little doubt that there's going to be a price overshoot in the coming years. And um, this is where the new production is needed. We're right there with the first mover advantage to take um, to really capitalise upon that overshoot in the market. And what we want to do is really then look to grow the company further and, and look for new acquisitions and look for new growth. So we've assembled the team, we've got the project, um, we're not constrained by South Australia. It's really a question of how, how well can we go going forward. But being there with this first mover advantage to sell into the market, generate cash and become a bigger player through exploration at Honeymoon and funding acquisitions is key. And uh, we're in a good place to do just that. But thanks again, Andrew. I appreciate it. And Duncan, what's the best way for folks to reach out to the company? You're most welcome to reach out to me directly, Duncan at bossenergy.com is the email address, or alternatively through your good self, Andrew, and we can tee up times. So thanks very much for the interest. Duncan, we'll keep up the good work, and I uh, look forward to chatting again soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you.